Episode 11 of the History Boys of Bird podcast. I'm here as always, Graham, with my co host Tony. How are you doing, mate? Not bad, especially after yesterday's slaughter. Mm. But we'll get to that later. Yes, we will. What we are going to talk about now is uh, Gail Heron. Giles Heron, aka mm. the Black Arrow or the Black Flash. I love it, I love it when uh, someone's like. Uh, non-white and then it's just always black something isn't yeah. it? I think that's more <laughs> of a generational thing because we, as we're going to talk about he was the first well we're going to talk about it right now he was the <laughs> first <laughs> uh, black professional soccer player in America and not soccer only that ball. Yep, and not only that he was the first mm, black player to play for Celtic the first black professional player to play for Celtic although he and was the first not, American the first even American even though he was Jamaican <laughs> yep, Jamaica via Canada, via Detroit. <laughs> so, who it's knows? Via a lot of places. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about uh, Gil Heron. Um, some people may have heard of his son, who is a famous poet, and jazz musician, soul singer, laureate, proto rapper, anything like that. You can you can name him because his son was rather influential. And it was uh, Gil Scott Heron. It's a bluesologist, I call himself. Bluesologist, well. yeah. I was lucky enough to mm-hmm. see him in Edinburgh about six or seven years ago. This was just Is before right? he died, yeah. And he did mention the Celtic thing. And I don't think he was that bothered about it. He was just like, oh, everyone talks about Celtic all the time, but I'm not that bothered. Anyway, here's another song. Over I was like, all right, over cool. At least, at least he mentioned it. But, so we're talking... Did he go to Foggy Drew after that? No, he didn't, but I wish he did. <laughs> I was listening to that today, actually. Uh, I was getting nice. my flatmate to, to play it in his Irish bar earlier on, but there you go. So... <laughs> We're talking about 1951-1952 season? Aye. Okay. So, the season before that, just to give you a bit of texture, a bit of contexture, let's make up a word. Basically, Celtic finished seventh uh, in the league the season before, so 1950-1951. Um, the only trophy that we won the season before was the Scottish Cup, and we beat Motherwell 1-0. Do you think the, the board released a DVD called Magnificent Seventh? No. Nah. Absolutely no, not. Neither. Absolutely not. I don't no. think you had DVDs back then, if I'm being honest. Pro- probably not. not. I mean, <laughs> I don't think we can tell, but probably not. Yeah. So they finished seventh in the league. Hibs won. This is, you know, we this is kind of over slightly overlapping with the squad. Obviously, the manager of the Coronation Cup that was episode seven of the podcast, the 1953 Coronation Cup. But we're talking about 1950, 1951 before we go into the the girl head on. Uh, Look at you remembering episode. Numbers, I know. Man. I've done my research, man. Uh, <laughs> so we beat Motherwell in the game, um, and we went on a tour of America uh, in that season in 1950-1951. Twenty years before that, in 1930-1931, we also went on a tour of America after beating Motherwell in the Scottish Cup. So hmm. twenty years apart, we played Motherwell in the Scottish Cup, we beat them, and then we went on a tour of North America. So there you go. Um, and we happen to beat, just to give you more information, in 1931, going even further back, we beat Motherwell in the same game, but it was actually in those days, if there was a final played and it was two each at the end of the game or a draw or whatever at the end of the game, there was a replay. So it went to replay and we ended up beating them 4-2. And McGrory, who was you know, James McGrory, ended up scoring three goals out of the six that we scored overall. So there you go. So And he was a manager in 51, was it? Yes. He was a manager throughout this this barren period that we we, we previously spoke about. Mm-hmm. We hadn't won the league since 1938, <coughs> and then as we spoke about before, we hadn't. There was like a a 16 year gap between winning, you know, the, the Scottish League 1938 to 54, and then we mm-hmm. won it again. But the manager in question was McGrory, um, and we signed Gil Heron in the um, the 1951 uh, 1952 season in August. The squad at that time to give you. Um, an idea of the squad. It's kind of similar to what the Coronation Cup squad was, but anyway, uh, John Bonner, Mike Hockey, Alex Rollo, Bobby Evans, Jimmy Mallon, Joe Bailey, Bobby Collins, Jimmy Walsh, Sean Fallon, Bertie Peacock, and Charlie Tully. And again, Hibs were on this winning streak of, of winning the Scottish League. Uh, Celtic finished ninth the season that we're going to be discussing. So 
although Gill had it come in and made a bit of an impact, it certainly was not enough to secure anything better than ninth, which was so I, much worse than I, the previous year. I saw a couple of uh, kind of uh, conflicting reports about how we actually got to see him. So it, there was one report that said that we just heard about him when we went mm. over there and yeah. we scouted him, and another one said that we played against him. Well, he was playing for um, the Detroit Wolverines or the Detroit Corinthians. It's there's not a lot of um, there's not much out there in the way of actually confirming this. It's just there's a question marks over who he was playing for at the time. It was either mm-hmm. the, the Wolverines or the Corinthians, and both were from Detroit, where he had moved to after he had... Because basically, he was born in Canada, eh, sorry, Jamaica, and then mm-hmm. he moved to Canada when he was young, and then he played for the Canadian Air Force. And he was a striker, mm-hmm. you should point that out, he was a centre-forward striker type. Um, and the story goes that Celtic done this tour of North America, and we played about nine games, and we were actually there for a full month in the summer which must have been daunting. And they took a boat to America. That's how long ago it was. They took a fucking boat. So we never actually played against... So that must have been about two weeks travelling as well. Probably. Man. That explains why they were away for so long. Aye. So, yeah. Um, we never actually played any teams from Detroit. I'm not sure if we played in Detroit. We may have played... In, I think we played teams like Fulham and Frankfurt and a Canadian all-star select and a USA all-star select sort of shape. Mm-hmm. But the, as you say, we we can't confirm whether or not he was just he just happened to like pop up and play for a team at that point just on the fly. Which I is, know in nineteen forty six in the uh, North America Soccer Football League, I love how they've got soccer mm. football in the one bit. He was a top goal scorer. Yep, he's so he probably had a bit of a reputation. And uh, I don't know if you saw this, but in Ebony Magazine, great name for a magazine, he was called the Babe Ruth of Soccer. Exactly, he scored fifteen of the twenty nine goals for the Detroit Wolverines, and they won the inaugural. NAPSL, which is the North American Professional Soccer League. So yeah, and Ebony Magazine. I think Ebony's a really famous uh, magazine. I think Eddie Murphy even quotes it in one of his stand-ups. Um, aye. aye. But yeah, he was the Babe Ruth of soccer. Um, but he wasn't the the, the, the first uh, non-white to play for Celtic. Although, the guy I'm about to mention is that Abdul Salim, who we were speaking about earlier, before we started recording. Abdul Salim, the Indian guy. He was given a trial we were even given trials out way back then, it seems, and he never signed for us in the end. I think he played a couple of reserve games, and uh, Abdul Salim was an Indian guy, and he chose to play barefoot like the Hurricanes. <laughs> so Was was it Abdul Salim or Mohammed Salim? I've got uh, Abdul Salim, Mohammed. Could be Mohammed Abdul Salim. However, he was, okay. the, he was the first non-white, technically, to, to pull on the hoops and play some games for us. Although he didn't play any first team games and he didn't sign a contract with us, he still technically played pumped out for the reserves. So yeah, with regards... Imagine getting like studs, studs on the foot. I know. Playing with the boots on. And the boots that they had back then would have been old cloggers. How many times would your Achilles go, man? I don't know. I've got a bad set of ankles as it is. I'm paranoid about my ankles as it is. That's why I don't play football (laughs) anymore. But, I mean... What I found out about Gil Heron before he signed for Celtic was that he was just a natural athlete. Like, you know, mm-hmm. he's one of these guys that's just born with it. He can play football. When he was at Celtic, he was playing for Pollock Cricket Club at the same time, and he was good. Right. And he was specialising. He, he won, like, boxing uh, trophies, boxing tournaments in Michigan. Ah, I saw he golden gloves. Ah, golden yeah. gloves in Michigan in the early forties. <laughs> he could speci- He was specialist in like a. He was an athlete. My understanding was that he was actually an athlete. Like an athlete, he was fast. He specialised like track and field. He's one of these guys that's just gifted. Like sports, you get these people. There's people like um, there's an NBA guy. It's called Will Chamberlain. A really, really famous NBA guy. I don't know if you know him, but he's like a Hall of Famer, an all round award winner. And he's won everything in the NBA. But he played. He could play pro volleyball. He got offered like scholarships to play basketball, football, volleyball. Competed in high jump, things like that. And you know, these people are just born with something that you can't really teach to someone that's not naturally yeah. gifted like that. So he was like this. I, I get the impression he was a bit of a whippet. I think he was like six foot, but I think he was a bit of a whippet. And we're going to find out why he did not succeed at Celtic as much as you would expect because. I think back then, and I don't think it's a surprise, that the football was probably a bit rough hmm. and a bit strong, and the players were a wee bit burly. Now, 
Not often I use that word because I've never used that word, but it's absolutely <laughs> apt. Burly. Use it again. A burly, burly, burly. So, like, back then, I think it was all, you know, like big, strong, fucking brute type guys that you would associate with football in the olden days. And this mm-hmm. Gil Veron came in, and he's like this flamboyant, forward, fast, pacey, athletic, probably quite slight and quite lean. And I just don't think the Scottish game suited him. But the first game that he played, what information do you have regarding? The game, his 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 um, the first game that he played for Celtic. So his first game was against uh, Morton, mm. uh, in the League Cup game he played. He played five times in total for Celtic. Yeah. He, he, he played, four of the games he played were in the League Cup for some reason, and they played one game in the league. Yeah. So forty thousand people are in attendance at Celtic Park. Celtic uh, going to win the game two 0 mm-hmm. It's quoted as the goal. The goal he scored was impressive as Heron swiftly stuck, struck the ball in the turn inside the penalty area against Scottish international goalkeeper Jimmy Cowan. Yeah. So it seems to be quite a smart goal. Uh, he moves on to his next game in a 2 0 win over Adrianians on the 29th of August. And apparently this was a counter attack, so again, maybe kind of looking at his pace. Yeah. Uh, he ran onto the ball from the centre circle and unleashed a stunning 20-yard strike against Fraser, who was also a Scottish international goalkeeper. Yep. So, I mean, there are, th- there are things you think to yourself, why did this not work out? Because he seems to be, he seems to have kind of quite a lot about him, you know? And when you think about this idea of, like, uh, being has with being burly players, mm. uh, if he's a boxer, then you think maybe, like, he's used to getting hit, so yeah, surely he'd be used to... And the, there, there, there is kind of like uh, information out there that kind of goes against this idea uh, that he was that he was bullied too much off of the ball and stuff like that. Is I got a Celtic historian Tom Campbell mm. thinks it was actually down to cliques Aye. and uh, parts of the squad that were kind of against her on. Uh, obviously, the kind of most obvious thing to think about here would be a racial thing, yeah. but he he goes against that. Thinks it's just it was like John McPhail was. John McPhail and so. Charlie Tully were, were um, they both they both saw him as a threat. I think Aye. he saw Heron as a threat. Obviously, this kind of um, extravagant guy comes into the squad um, and makes an instant impact in, in, in what was McPhail and to an extent T- Tully's position. And Aye. these Aye. like Tully and McPhail, my understanding were that they were like the Ronaldo, the John Terry's of the dressing room, like second managers, and they had like a power. Uh, the collective power over certain people. So what you're saying about the cliques is is probably true. And I did read as well that the historian Tom Campbell's, you know, completely dismissed the idea that the um the treatment of of Heron was racially motivated. He he actually said that Heron wasn't the only one that got the treatment. There were other players that came and were sort of um snubbed. But I also went on to read. Did you read about um Bobby Collins and Sean Fallon and how they they responded to that? I no, I did not. So apparently um Bobby Collins and Sean Fallon both really um liked Heron. They really took to him. Bobby Collins is mm-hmm. many have been absolutely fizzing with the treatment of Heron and actually during one of the games they were playing against Third Lanark, I think it was, uh, he was refusing to pass to McPhail because of the way he treated Heron. Okay. So okay. obviously professionalism wasn't like um paramount back then. You know, like people are arguing in the dressing room and arguing on the pitch. But um, I think that goes down because back to like uh, the kind of management of Jimmy McGrory. Was he properly in control of the, the team, or was it a kind of the, the tail wagging the dog a little bit? Yeah, I think so. I think I think that because it wasn't it wasn't the manager that signed her on. It was uh, Robert Kelly. Celtic mm-hmm. basically in the nineteen fifties and the nineteen sixties. I'm not sure when this ended. I think let's call it a ten year window. Celtic at the start of every season would hold a public trial where you could go mm-hmm. along and, and you could try out to play for Celtic now obviously you would have to be good but when that that's how they invited um, Gil had on over they invited him to play in that trial we actually also signed up uh, in a similar sort of way we should have mentioned this a minute ago but you know we're talking about the North American tour we also signed a player from the North American tour a Canadian called uh, Joe Kenaway have you heard of him? He was a goalie was he? Aye over two, yeah. well over 200 appearances for Celtic and it was the same sort of idea with um, with Heron and him coming over. They just came over. It's a, it's a, it's a good idea. I mean, yeah. a good way to get talent. Yeah. Know, so. Especially if a guy goes on and plays, I think it was 263 appearances for Celtic. I mean, that, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, but yeah, Robert Kelly offered uh, the, the Gil the deal. And 
Gill was supposedly saying, now, this is a quote, he says that Glasgow Celtic was the greatest name in football to me. And he also mm-hmm. went on to say that this was a Jackie Robinson-like invitation. It was something that had been beyond the reach and outside the dreams of blacks. Now, I'm not sure if he said that or someone else said that. but I think it was his son. Ah, uh, maybe. So, we want to talk about Jackie Robinson. Do you want to, do you want to explain who Jackie Robinson was? I believe that he was the first kind of he was the first African American that played in the the major in Major League Baseball. Yeah, was that right? Like professional, and he absolutely smashed it. Uh-huh. Uh, so he was a, a groundbreaker, um, leading the way, and, and I think that Gills maybe saw himself as someone similar to Jackie Robinson in breaking the barriers, and, and rightly so. But mm-hmm. so we signed him off the back of a, of a trial, um, and he makes five first team appearances. Then what imagine happens, signing somebody in front of uh, imagine signing someone in the back of a trial, man. It's I know we don't do it anymore. That That's an, that was an idea <laughs> we were. I, I think we were discussing about for another podcast um, to do one on the trials that players have the came trials. To, the trials. There's many of them. George Amaral, I remember him. I know. Even <laughs> De La Pena. Anyway, so <laughs> after um, so he scored. How many games did he play for us, and how many goals did he score? So it was two goals in five games, and then they get relegated to the reserves, where they apparently got a goal every game for five Aye. for fifteen games. Saw that fifteen and fifteen. That's amazing. Aye. and another kind of uh, theory on why he, it wasn't working out for him was apparently uh, Robert Kelly didn't look uh, fav- favorably on players with poor discipline, and apparently Heron started a fight with a player on the the pitch in a reserve match and get Aye. red carded. Right. Okay. I can. I, you can imagine the old like. Uh, Put up your jukes, uh, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, totally. I, I mean, no, I, I don't think many players get red card in reserve matches. So, well, uh, it's, it, that tells me that he's not, he's not to cut out. <laughs> he's just fucking he's, dick. He's, if, he's, if, he's a, <laughs> if he's an ex boxer, then he's obviously got something about him. Um, I, I think a, a lot of his information I should have added. Um, his last game was the one before Jockstein's debut. That's right. I, I imagine they played together. That would have been an amazing story. Still an amazing story regardless, but that would have made it even extra special. Um, yep, yep. So he 15 and 15 for the reserves. He scored one goal against Morton. And who was his other goal against in the first team? Airdrie. Yeah, okay. So. okay, and who, what were the other... Do you have a list of the teams that he played against? The five? So we had Morton, Airdrie. On the, the Celtic wiki, they've got them down as playing five games, but they've only got them down as... Uh, They've only got four of them written down. Okay. So I'll just I'll just get and get that in a second. So you've obviously got Martin Airdrie, and then they say he played against he played against Martin again, also in the League Cup, and he played against Partick in a two one win. So they've got five appearances down, but they've only got the details for four of the matches. Ah, so. okay, okay, I can yeah. see that. Yeah, Gil went on. I can see that he played. Um, we beat Partick for so two one. Um, yeah, using yeah. the Celtic website for that one, um, but yeah. So after Celtic, well, obviously he's Jamaican, but then he moved to Canada. He played for the Canadian Air Force. Then ended up, his, you know, his, his talents took him to America, where he lived in America for some time. And I think mm-hmm. it was actually in Detroit when he was living in Detroit and wasn't playing for the Wolverines or the Corinthians. Um, but he had his son who was who was Gil Scott Heron, who, you know, he, we're going to play some music uh, at the start of this. You've probably heard it by now, but yeah, and at the end probably as well. But Gil Scott Heron, that's when he was born. He was born in Detroit and the rest is history. But he went on to be capped by Jamaica. Uh, by Jamaica. You know, back in the day, you could get away with playing for maybe one or two different uh, international teams. And he was mm-hmm. playing for Jamaica. And he was also, he had, a, he had a, 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 quite a few different names. One of his names was um, obviously Gil Heron, then it was Giles Heron, then it was Gile, and then Gilly. Gilly Heron, so he had multiple different names. And do you have anything else about his personality, the way he was? Was he, you know? There's a, there's a quote from the Guardian ob- obituary about him, oh. and it says, uh, Although Gil Heron's time at Celtic Park was brief, his considerable sense of style, both on and off the park, made a lasting impression and became a feature of his son's UK concerts that some of his fans turned up wearing Celtic tops. And apparently he used to he stood about Glasgow with sharp suits on and trilby hats. Oh, I can believe that. I can believe <laughs> that. Smooth guy, a smooth guy. Um, on... You could just wonder what, what would have happened to Gil Heron's Jamaican career if he had crossed paths with maybe John Barnes as the manager of, of Jamaica. <laughs> I mean, I think he could have gone into legend status at that yeah. point. Um, perhaps. Um, 
on my, my research travels, uh, I came across the, uh, a WordPress blog found by a guy called Dancing Boy. Um, mm-hmm. I, I didn't I didn't tweet him or anything like that. I only managed to find his his, his Twitter earlier on, but his name is Dancing Boy with a B H O Y. Anyway, he he had a little story, an anecdote on his um in his blog about his dad's experience uh, in meeting Gil Heron. So I'm going to just read it verbatim. Cool. He says, last night I was at my dad's watching Man United in the Champions League. The gulf between them and my team Celtic is vast these days. Ten years ago, we could compete or at least hold our own, but we went backwards. Lack of investment and the investment that has been made has been poorly spent. We were chatting during the game and I was asking my dad if he could remember Gil Heron. To, pra- to my surprise, my dad said that he'd met him personally. Dad, age 16, was a prefect in St Anthony's Boys Guild in Govan. He played football for the school and they occasionally had visits from Celtic players or management. On the day in question, Dad was training at the St Anne's pitch when there was a visit from Celtic players Sean Fallon, Joe Bailey and the new signing Gil Heron. Gil had recently scored in his Celtic debut, a 2-0 win against St Morton in the Scottish Cup. Sean was the goalkeeper in 1951 when Celtic won the Scottish Cup, as we spoke about, and went mm-hmm. on to become Jockstein's right-hand man. Dean, of course, was the manager when Celtic won the European Cup in 1967. The visitors joined my dad and his team on the pitch for a brief kickabout. Then dad and the rest of the boys, Guild, went down to St Anthony's Church Halls and were given a talk by all three footballers. Gil was a bright, funny man and happy to meet everyone. My dad was telling me that he did impressions and a particularly good Humphrey Bogart. As the Celtic players left, he shook my dad's hand. There nice. you go. Dancing boy, thank you very much. <laughs> I would like to hear that uh, Humphrey Bogart impression. Uh, very good. <laughs> um, <coughs> how are you feeling? I am getting better, getting better. But one one thing I would say about this is that I feel I feel we were people maybe think yeah we're only doing this guy because of who his son was and who his son became. Mm. But the point of this podcast from the beginning is doing the kind of bigger things and doing the smaller things. I think one of the first things I said to you when we started talking about the podcast was like do we or something like that. Yeah. You know? Like so we're talking about Gil Heron because. He scored for Celtic, which is fucking a start. Mm-hmm. First uh, African American or first black player to play for Celtic, and also because he had a kill cool son. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, so, exactly, yeah. And, and and it proves that Celtic were quite an open-minded, diverse club from the beginning. I guess you know because to think about it, um, you go back decades and decades and decades ago. I, I, I maybe I'm generalising here, but I'm not entirely sure that. The, the culture would be so welcoming back then as it was as it is mm-hmm. now I don't know maybe I'm just speculating I don't know but it's it's significant as you say he played for Celtic he scored for Celtic he made an impact at Celtic he obviously had a famous son but it's just the way that things happened it, it was just an interesting one to talk about he actually went on like he, he died I think he was really old when he died I think he was about 86 when he died but yeah. before he died he, he uh, published a collection of poems and poetry um, and I've got one here that he wrote about his time in Scotland. And apparently he spoke very fondly about, you know, about his time in Scotland to whoever, whoever was listening. Uh, his son, you know, Gil Scott, actually is, is on record as saying, yeah, my dad used to check Celtic scores and I would go to ACC, he would always keep an eye out for the scores. So there you go. But he, he wrote a poem and uh, I'm going to give you it again with my, my dulcet tones and I'm going to read it verbatim. <laughs> so apologise in advance if this is bad, but here it goes. So it's called The Great Ones. I remember all the great ones, those that I have seen, those who, I've, those who I have played with, who wore the white and green. There was Tully and Bobby Evans, no greater ones you'd see. In Celtic Park was our haven, to win was our destiny. There was Sammy Cox and Thornton, Woodburn was there too. Waddle and the great George Young, who wore the white and blue. There was Riley and Turnbull for the Hibs, Billy Steele and the great Dundee. I remember all the great ones, wherever I may be. So let there be a Hall of Fame. The fans will all be there. The stars will all be remembered by loved ones everywhere. Not bad. It's, it's, you know, that and the kind of the thought of yeah. someone, someone like that, or anyone who kind of had this brief, brief spell in Celtic history, just the fact that they would have been looking out for Celtic results yeah. and seeing, for example, Celtic winning the European Cup in nineteen sixty-seven. I mean, these guys would have gone back. They've living their lives and just yeah. I, I, that's, there's something strong about that. There's something really kind of, I don't know, it's having that lasting impression in loads of people's lives, you know? Yeah, and that's kind of why we do this, these little um, small snippets of Celtic's history that, you know, that we like to talk about. And, as it, you know, we thought I, I always shoot you down when you suggest something. I mean, that's too obvious, but 
it's these little small ones, these little um, tiny parts of the history that maybe people don't know about. Because we spoke earlier about putting out on Twitter if anyone had anything, but obviously, I'm not sure a lot of people know who Gil Heron was, or you know, they don't know much about him. And the idea for yeah. this podcast is to sort of like shine a light on parts of the history that you know that we are we we, we know a tiny bit about, but then we do the research and then we, we try and um, talk about it and, and, and make it interesting for people. So. I thought this was a good one to do. Um, do you have anything else about Gil Heron? Just, just his kind of like uh, a short bit in his career after mm. Celtic. Yep. So obviously, I went to to Third Atlantic. Mm. He actually had a really, really good goal scoring record for them. He only played in League Cup matches. I don't know why this is happening. <laughs> Maybe it's like a kind of Ronaldo situation at the Huns. It was like I'm only going to play in the League Cup. Yeah. But uh, he played seven games for Third Atlantic and he scored five goals, which is fucking exceptional. Yeah. Right? And then he went on to Kidderminster Harriers. I, don't, I didn't get any kind of records for him down there. But uh, it seems to be the, the theme going about his career is that he maybe had some kind of physical issues with, with playing in the British League. I don't know. Mm. But he he played. He started quite well apparently there and then went into the reserves and then that was him. He went back to Detroit after that and played again for either the Detroit... Corinthians yeah. or the Detroit it, it depends. It depends where you look. It's, it's the Corinthians <coughs> or the Wolverines. I never thought I'd ever say that sentence, but there you go. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's that's Gil Scott Heron. And, and just to let, just to say that we we are trying to get um, speak to um, one of his sure. family members. Um, we're in the process of like trying to arrange an interview with a family member. So should we receive a response, which we're hopeful of. Yep. Um, we'll be recording a small interview with a family member of uh, Gil Heron and we'll put that out attached with this hopefully yeah you will not be able to stay home brother you will not be able to plug in turn on and cop out you will not be able to lose yourself on Skag and skip out for beer during commercials because the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by Xerox in four parts without commercial interruptions. The revolution will not show you pictures of Nixon blowing a bugle and leading a charge by John Mitchell, General Abrams, and Spiro Agnew to eat hog moths confiscated from a Harlem sanctuary. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by the shape of a war theater and will not star Natalie Woods and Steve McQueen or Bullwinkle and Julia. The revolution will not give your mouth sex appeal. The revolution will not get rid of the nub. The revolution will not make you look five pounds thinner because the revolution will not be televised, brother. There will be no pictures of you and Willie Mae pushing that shopping cart down the block on the dead run or trying to slide that color TV into a stolen ambulance. NBC will not be able to predict the winner at 8.32 on the court from 29 District. The revolution will not be televised. There will be no pictures of pigs shooting down brothers on the instant replay. There will be no pictures of pigs shooting down brothers on the instant replay. There will be no pictures of Whitney Young being run out of Harlem on the rail with a brand new process. There will be no slow motion or still life of Roy Wilkins strolling through what in a red, black, and green liberation jumpsuit that he has been saving for just the proper occasion. Acres, Beverly Hillbillies, and Hooterville Junction will no longer be so damn relevant, and women will not care if Dick finally got down with Jane on Search for Tomorrow, because black people will be in the street looking for a brighter day. The revolution will not be televised. There will be no highlights on the 11 o'clock news and no pictures of Harry R. Women Liberationist and Jackie Onassis blowing her nose. The theme song will not be written by Jim Webb or Francis Scott Keyes, nor sung by Glenn Campbell. Tom Jones, Johnny Cash, Engelbert Humperdinck, or the rare earth, the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be right back after a message about a white tornado, white lightning, or white people. You will not have to worry about a dove in your bedroom, the tiger in your tank, or the giant in your toilet bowl. The revolution will not go better with coke. The revolution will not fight germs that may cause bad breath. The revolution will put you in the driver's seat. The revolution will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised. The revolution will be no rerun, brothers. The revolution will be live. 
So let's move on to the modern football. And this week we've got a, a guest who's a Gilly from at underscore Celtic Vines. And if you don't follow them on Twitter, they have uh, little videos, obviously Vines, of uh, Celtic goals and stuff like that. So Gilly, why don't you tell uh, the listeners something about you and your Celtic background? I of course, mate. Um, like most Celtic fans, it comes uh, from my family, from my dad and my uncles and my grandpa. I remember being young and all them going to games, and I was too young being allowed to go. And then one time when they're all leaving the house and I, I wanted to go, my dad turned around at the last minute and went, "Oh, here you go, got a ticket for you. You're coming today." <laughs> and that was it. Uh, Celtic uh, Everton two each in 1990. I was seven. Uh, went and stood in the Celtic end, and and that was it. Nice, nice. So you're a season ticket holder now, Gilly? Um, I've had my season ticket. Well, I had a season ticket for Tommy Burns' first season at Parkhead. I, went, I actually went a few games at Hamden and a few games at the old Parkhead when I was younger. But when the Celtic moved to the new Parkhead and the, the new North Stand was built, I had my season ticket from then until Strachan's third season solid. But when it got to Strachan's first season, I kind of... I wasn't really enjoying the football that was getting played. It was a bit of a chore. You know, right. My dad just fought for the money that was get, getting paid. We didn't have the same connection. And yeah. we, I still, to be fair, I still went a good 10, 15 games a season. But then this season, when uh, Rogers got announced, I was up at Parkhead for him getting announced. Smoke yeah. bombs going off. Yeah. Police was going wild. It's the best <laughs> atmosphere at Parkhead since possibly. Like, I think my land game was decent, but since Dial was there, the atmosphere kind of died. Rogers is just. And, uh, brought that all back and season ticket being every game no missed a minute of the home games this season it's just been something else been absolutely brilliant yeah. I think that was a common complaint under striking that like the football was shite like everyone there was a I would start I would rather be like playing you know people were arguing that they would rather see shite football and like win games 1-2 now as long as they're winning but people like no nah, I'd rather like be winning 5-4 and seeing as it concede hundreds of goals uh, but well, as long as we're winning, there was, a, there was a constant battle. I remember during Strachan's tenure about that sort of stuff. Well, there's a definitely a fine balance because under uh, Tommy Burns, uh, we didn't really win much, but it was the best football and some of the best experiences I've ever had being a Celtic fan. Some of the atmospheres, like when uh, we beat Aberdeen 5 nothing, and we blew the radio apart with the volume and mm-hmm. things like that. Exactly. So, obviously, the, the angle that we, we, we asked you to come on for, Gilly, um, was the fact that you are a, you, you live in Glasgow. Um, and you are a season ticket holder and you attended the game yesterday and you attend games. So we just wanted to find out from you what it was like. But before we do that, obviously, with me and Graham, we are abroad and I was watching it yesterday in a CSE in Madrid, the local Madrid Emeralds. Uh, and Graham, uh, you were watching it in your house on your Celtic TV? Oh, yeah, I was just watching it uh, on my Todd. Uh, obviously, right. not f- feeling too good at the moment. So so let, let, let's get to it then. Let's chop up this, this, this fucking amazing, mighty performance yesterday. I mean, it's a silly question to ask, but like, let me hear what you think, Graham. Like, what's your your overriding feelings of the game? Like, try and try and describe how you feel, what what you thought, what stood out. Obviously, Dembele is an obvious one, but um, what what do you think? What do you feel? I, for me, it was like uh, obviously we 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 all think I take it the three of us think that, that Rangers died, and this is a kind of a reincarnation of them. And going into this, I didn't have as much nerves like in the, the week build up because I just I don't know it felt as if it was something different. But see, yeah. as soon as the TV went on and you just saw their section, and it's a section that you've seen for so long, and, and that kind of the, obviously the extended away section and the, the other yeah. flags and everything. And that's when I started thinking, get into these fucking bastards, man. When you see the segregation between like the twenty the twenty aye. seats that aye. have like literally like probably three hundred seats up the length of the, the the height of the stadium that have to be separated between us and, and those cunts. Um, exactly, aye, yeah. aye. And uh, one the one thing I said on Twitter yesterday was it, it f- felt really good because it was they didn't they didn't lay a hand on us at all like they, they didn't lay a glove. Like we, I mean, obviously, they, obviously they scored the goal, and I, I don't think we should spend a lot of time talking about them. Not that we have much to say on them. I, I don't believe we should talk no. about them. anyway. But no. apart from the goal and that one Barry McKay chance that just sort of zipped past the post, they were mm-hmm. absolutely fucking shambolic. Aye, aye. But the, the the thing about the first half for us was we didn't actually. I don't know what you guys thought, but it felt as if we weren't kind of opening them up as much as I wanted, maybe in the first half hour or so. We had lots of the ball, but we just didn't seem to be making any kind of uh, inroads in, on their goal. What did you guys I think agree about with that? that? I agree with that. At the game, I was, I was kind of thinking that. We had a lot of kind of good possession, but we weren't really penetrating them as much as we should. There was a lot of sideways passing when 
I like to see kind of direct passing, like going out wide to Forrest, out wide to Sinclair or forward to Dembele. Mm -hmm. Forrest got enough, a lot of the ball in the first half, but Dembele and Sinclair didn't have enough ball time, in my opinion. They're two very good attacking players, far better than what Rangers have got anywhere in the park. Give mm -hmm. them the ball and they're going to cause them trouble. I think one of the problems that we that we have and, and any team has is it, they sat with 10 men behind the ball. They played that Garner, whatever his face, like they played him on the centre circle and every man was behind the ball. So breaking that down is going to be difficult. I think that's why we played Tom Rogic because he's in there to sort of unlock um, defences with those those passes. And, and, and Tom Rogic is somebody I think we should talk about because he's played a lot of football this season and he's been one of the standout performers for Celtic. But, and there's always been this sort of... Um, warranted chat until recently anyway it was warranted that he couldn't last 90 minutes although he's now played I don't know maybe four or five games this season where he's completed the full match and mm -hmm. um, it was clear yesterday that while, while I think his contribution yesterday was, was good his ball retention is like second to none like the way he uh, holds the ball I watched back the the, the, the whole game and then in that first half Roger was brilliant man like it, there was Aye. there was that time I don't know if you remember it it was like there was just there was Huns all around him, or zombies all around him, and he just was like, kind of, he managed to get away from it, and then eventually get filled, but he held the ball for a good five, six seconds when they were all about him, you know? He reminds me of, he reminds me of Commons, in the, <coughs> like, in the sense, the, the, only, the only reason I'm saying this is because he wins a lot of free kicks. Like, he, his ball retention is so good that the opposition just end up hacking him. Like, mm -hmm. the amount of times, that yesterday he just appeared with the ball from, and he's, like, he just appears, as you say, surrounded by Huns, Mm -hmm. And he just comes away with the ball. I noticed that he's, he was quite confident as well. He's hitting a lot of shots from outside Aye. the box. That's actually something I noticed. And that little reverse Celtic. pass, that little disguise pass for Sinclair on the left. Uh, yeah. Gilly, do you remember that one? I've not watched the game over again. I've been quite busy um, celebrating yesterday <laughs> and then I had a christening today, so I've not had the pleasure of watching it again. So I'm going to look out for that. But just, just on, Roderick, at the game... I felt as if Rangers were um, targeting him and they were going for him, especially Cranshaw and Barton. And it was every time Roger was taking his great touch, doing his usual turn, he was getting hit and it was kind of breaking up play. And it was like they were deliberately going for him. I'd love to see the stats, how many fouls actually got um, a for him yesterday. I, th I think, I think, he, I think, like at least he won at least three free kicks. Now, I, I, that doesn't seem like a lot, but he was only on the pitch for 50 minutes. Right. He was only on the pitch, but he got, he got subbed at 50, 50 first, 50 second minute for Armstrong. He might have only got three kicks, but it's probably won't uh, double that. But you know what Colm's like as a referee, to be fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I like I, I think that um, the problem that we had with Rogic yesterday was that the, the tiredness kicked in because he was away with international uh, Australia. Uh, yeah, just yeah. Just on that, um, a friend of my dad's kind of got a wee connection with Jackson Irvine, and he was saying to him, I think he writes a blog as well, but he was saying to him that he reckons there's a good possibility the way he's watching Roderick progress, he'll end up being the greatest Australian footballer ever. Right. He just sees it, um, he's going on like leaps and bounds, just getting stronger, bigger, and just getting better and better the more he sees him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that mantle goes to Tim Cahill, who's probably still playing football somewhere now, but I, 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 like, I'm a fan of Rogic, and I have been a fan of Rogic, as I'm quite a rosy Celtic fan, like, I've always backed him, and he, he took he took a lot of... Uh, Pelters in the earlier in his Celtic career, but I mean he's 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 going to be a big player for this season. But I like I think the tiredness was the issue that we took him off. Um, because he was in Australia. I, I, I'm not sure if he flew to Australia then flew to like Dubai, or he flew to Dubai and then just came here. However, he did have to um fly a long haul flight and then a long haul flight back, and he came back on Wednesday. But I thought I'm pretty sure Roger said that he was he was feeling fine and he was he was quite satisfied with him. But obviously he made a contribution yesterday and obviously um. Armstrong, um, who's something, someone that's taking divides fellas. opinions. No, it's not even dividing opinions. In my opinion, <laughs> it's dividing opinions. But in my opinion, all the slack that he's got, he's deserved. He's like, it's apart from the Inter Milan game, and he scored that one goal against Motherwell at the end of last season. Like, he's not really turned up. I think he played well against Partick Thistle in one of his first games. Him and Gary McKay Stephen were in aye, that honeymoon period aye. when they were both really good away from home. Away from home, yeah, I remember. Yeah, uh, I've been like just expected so much Armstrong, kind of this midfield that would break on in the box and get on the end of things, and he just seems to kind of play within himself. And, and I fall into the category where I, I don't think he should be playing on the left, and I was getting so frustrated with Dyla continually playing him on the left and just the fact that Ronnie Dalio wouldn't buy another left mid or try another left mid and it was this guy who's clearly right footed to, in my opinion 
was playing out of position. When he comes on yesterday, he had a more central role, and Rodgers has commented saying that that's what he sees as, as better position. And some of the um, his play yesterday was what you're expecting from the guy we signed. The th- the, the the thing about it is that yeah, Armstrong's had an, has had plenty of appearances this season in a central position to kind of hold down a spot. You know what I mean? And he's just never took them. Today, yesterday, I thought he had a great a great uh, forty minutes or something like that. But I mean, he's been playing central, and he's just not. He's he's never shown that kind of performance. So far for Celtic, I don't think there is there is that myth. It's like oh, he's, he's playing at position, he's playing at position, and then he, then he gets played yesterday, and he has one good game in about twenty five, and everyone's like, see, he should be playing centrally. I'm like, no, nah. he played centrally under Dyla on occasion. He's played centrally this season, and he's just not done it. But I think the benefit we had yesterday was we're playing against a team who were shitting themselves. Rangers were sh- they shot themselves basically. He came on, he was running at them. They they couldn't handle. The directness they couldn't handle no. his pace, and I, and I think Rogers did tell the team to go out and hit digs from long range because it seemed like everyone had a shot from outside the box. Everyone I'm sure shot digs. was great, man. That one uh, yeah. just before we scored, uh, that was a brilliant shot. We actually I got a, a bit yeah. of feedback. I just want to bring it in now that, that we're talking about it. It's uh, from Robert Sherry at Pilatus underscore Ouija. He said Armstrong question mark Could he play the number ten instead of Tam Rogic in Barcelona? Uh, I don't know why uh, Robert wants Tam Rogic out. He would he would been the team of the week for me. I don't know what you, what you guys think about that. Aye, he stays. I you think like? so. Aye, I think Roger stays. It just gives you that wee bit of magic sometimes, with a wee slip to the right, slip to the rest, or some just shooting like we've seen against Command away from home. He's, he offers that where Armstrong doesn't. Maybe in a few months or next season, maybe. But right now, I think uh, number ten role is Roger's. And Armstrong I, I, can I, always run a defence, like later yeah. on in a game, he can come on and do that kind of stuff, like the pitch off kind of position. You know what I mean? Just run run behind the strikers. So, I mean, uh, for me, there's no one in the squad that can do what Roger can do. And that's hold up the ball, can skin players for fun, he can pass, he can hit long range digs. He can tr- his, his ball retention is amazing. In fact, he reminds me of Chris Commons. Well, the Chris Commons is still in the squad, so that's the, only guy, that's the only guy I would say can, uh, um, has got those attributes you're just talking about, but he seems to be so far out of the picture it's not really worth yeah. discussing. But that's like yeah. a conversation for a different day. But just on Roger. What I noticed about Roger, I think like, he took his turns yesterday in the first half and he was turning and he was it's just as if he just wasn't getting away from his man as much as usual. And I think it's because of the tempo of the game, um, he wasn't really used to it. Whereas he played like Tamarnock and Motherwell and teams like that, you get away from your defender okay. But Rangers were swarming over him. And what I thought yesterday was when Armstrong came on, his third contribution in the game was to take a touch, turn and pass it straight to Dembele. The belly's a danger man. He turned mm. and ran and then slipped in Sinclair. As good as Rodrix is, I don't know if he would have made that pass because yeah. he might have wanted to hold on to the ball a wee bit more and looked for something else. But that's something I've seen at the game. In the game, you're times 10. You're hypercritical. If the ball doesn't go your way, you're, you're blaming everyone. So I've not watched it again. So that could just be kind of a raw emotion kind of feeling. But that was what I had from being at the game. It's good to have so, the two different options, especially when... Yeah. Before before this game, I think uh, everyone had written Armstrong off completely. Now he's maybe got a little bit of a, a, a little bit of leeway. Uh, would you say? Uh, but definitely, aye. So I Kelly, know. sorry, so I'm I'm curious, you know, because we we're abroad here, um, and you were actually at the game. I just want you to try and paint a picture of what what it was like inside the stadium. So obviously, we never scored for the first half an hour or something like that. What was the build up like? How what was the like the 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 actual the actual personal physical atmosphere like? Outside the stadium, the build-up to the stadium. I mean, even in Glasgow, like obviously me and Graham are completely separate from all that, apart from unless we log on to the computer. But all we need to do is shut that over and we're away again. What was it like? Well, I think if you ask every Celtic fan, they're going to give you a different answer to this question. But for me, I woke up yesterday and I just felt confident. I just felt the players we've got, whether Griffiths plays or not, Dembele's a belter. He's going to he's going to give us something. It's not like last season when we played them in the semi final when literally all of our hopes were pinned on Lee Griffiths. This time we've actually got a team of men, a team of winners, and if Griffiths or Dembele doesn't step up, Sinclair would or Roberts would or whoever. So that there was a kind of confidence, but not an arrogance. We knew we had to go there, you had to compete with them. As long as we compete with them, which we didn't do in the semi final, I was confident that we would get a result. Um, I got to the stadium. Um, with my dad and my mate, we parked the car quite early, about quarter past ten. Um, sat in the car for a while, talked about it, and, and walked up. As always, you don't see any Rangers fans, so that's pretty good until you get into the stadium. And to be fair, before the game, 
there was they were in the, the section pretty early. There were a lot of kind of flags out and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. As always, Celtic fans notoriously come in late, but with about five minutes to go, you couldn't really hear them, and you didn't hear them much of the full game. The Celtic, the atmosphere was as good as I've experienced for a long time at Parkhead. Like, there were songs starting from everywhere. It wasn't just relying on the standing section of the Green Brigade, whatever you want to call them, that group, they're brilliant. But if, for games like this, Champions League games, uh, the new co games, you're going to get the atmosphere that you want at Parkhead, and that's just songs from everywhere, lots of different songs. Um, the atmosphere was excellent. I, I sit in 445, which is like the kind of north corner with the Jock Steen stand right. up the, right. the top. Um, it was pretty nervous uh, the first until we get the goal, to be fair, because for the first 15, 20 minutes, I thought we were a better team, and then they actually kind of came into it, and I'm thinking, fuck's sake, you know what I mean? don't let them get a snidey goal that they usually do, like Kenny Miller sneaking into the back post. <laughs> they, they, pretty, they, pretty, they pretty much, the goal they scored was just exactly what you described. Aye. What did you think of uh, Lustig? Was he was he to blame for this, or is, is it just a kind of goal that you lose? In my opinion, I felt Lustig was slightly poor defensively in the first half. I felt Barry McKay get in behind him twice, uh, at least two dangerous occasions, and I felt for that goal, when you look at it and you break it down, he probably should have done better at the back post with Kenny Miller. But I, I'm not one of those people that goes, oh, every goal should be stopped, because it's football, goals are scored, you need yeah. to accept that. Uh, my, my, my concern was like, and obviously I was watching it in a, in a busy pub, and the screen wasn't the biggest, and I was at the back of the pub. Look at the the, the, ref, uh, the referee, the goalkeeper didn't even jump. He, he he was like on the ground. He didn't even like put his hands up to catch the ball. It sort of flew over his head, and that wee fucking dick sort of jumped up and sort of put it put it in. I, I thought De Vries was partly to blame for their goal. Mm. I've not seen the goal again, so I really I couldn't comment. But just from seeing it once at the game, I, I thought Kenny Miller's header was going in. To be fair, I might be wrong, but I thought it, it said it was actually going to go in, and then Garner and whoever at the back post both kind of just bundled the ball in, and it was it was a, a, a bit of a bad time to lose a goal because it two nothing. I said to my dad, "This is party time." Like the place was going fucking mental. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean, you're thinking this is going to be four, five, or six. We're going to put them to the sword, which we did eventually. But I don't even want to let them score one goal. I don't no, want to see them no, celebrate the goal. That one. Aye. It was like the, the, the <coughs> it was a complete deflation. Like the, it was just, as you say, Celtic were, were flying at that point, and the atmosphere was amazing. Everyone was like, "I can't believe this is where actually going to scud them." And then they score. I think that was the. I think that was their only shot on goal. Until the last, uh, the, the, the shot right Apart, of the whistle went yeah. at the end of the match. Aye, DeVries saves it, like, it's a really good save from DeVries. Kelly, I don't know if you noticed, but at one point I showed you the statistics on the screen, Celtic had 92% possession. <laughs> the, the, the wee guy beside me actually said, his brother told him at half time, and I said, ah, you must be mistaken, no, no. there's no way that's real, was that real? Aye. It was, uh, well, it was like last five minutes, I, I've no idea why they do. I the thought it was more than minutes. that. Well, it's... 92%. Not that possession uh, is everything, but it just shows you that Celtic were, were uh, really comfortable. So, obviously, Celtic uh, are um, 2-1 at half-time. Then, what, what's what's happening at half-time? Like, how, how, how is the stadium? What, what's, your, what's your opinion? To be fair, I think at, at half-time, both sets of fans are a wee bit kind of not really sure. It wasn't going crazy at half-time either way, because if it was 2-0 or is it half-time, it would have been party time, it would have been rubbing it right into them. But you're still thinking, could they come back and get a goal and kind of embarrass us here and, and they're probably sitting thinking right we've got away with that so the, the atmosphere wasn't too wild at half time and there was a bit of nerves in the, in the start of the second half when I felt they actually came into the game and they passed it about and we were a wee bit slow out of the blocks to be fair I liked the, the half time uh, banner from the Green Brigade about the, the going for 55 points I quite liked that was it not 55 months in existence? Uh, or was it 55 it, months in existence? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've seen that. There was a few good banners at half time. There was one behind me. I think it was um, Warburton's a fanny, Wallace's a grass. Uh, Joseph, Joseph Anthony and the Barton will see you at mass. <laughs> it's fucking amazing, man. <laughs> just, it's not only is it good, it's all accurately true. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's absolutely class. Um, and Graham, so um, obviously Dembele gets the man of the match for, for, for obvious reasons. Is there anyone else that you thought... Um, Stood out, like for example, Coral Toure or uh, actually uh, Toure for me is going to go down as one of the best signings of the last maybe five ten years. He's, Agreed. He's fuck it. He's cool as fuck, man. Like it's see that he actually there was one point you'll see it when you watch it back, but he actually had slide tackles. 
someone like a full fucking sliding across the ground and gets the ball it's brilliant uh, like it's, it's Endros' slide tackle <laughs> uh, the, the one he's still going not, not quite that one no but I know he was he's, he's got such a calming influence and every time you can have the, the camera would pan to him when, when the ball was out of play or something he's always, always telling people to calm down or he's telling people to think about it he's, he's got such a good presence at the back I think so uh, I think he's going to be a great signing like uh, you, you sometimes seen him like he's not overruling Brown, he's not like superseding Brown, but you, like I've seen like shots where he's barking orders at people and like, Brown's just like standing like doing something else. I'm, like, uh, he, is, he is like our captain, and I don't think anyone sort of um, could have guessed the influence or the impact that he has made. And like yeah. see 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 when it comes to um, you know the young players we've got in the team, like, Sviatchenko must be like what 23, 24. Uh, the Connell players, like that, the influence that he's going to have. On our squad, exactly, it's going to yeah. be massive. It's going to be absolutely massive. And he took a, he took a yellow card as well. Um, he just uh, who was it? I think it was Garner or Mackay. He just fucking cleared him out. Mackay, I think. I, think. Ah, I just cleared. I think, him out I think there's him. one guy that probably. I think there's one guy that probably knew the influence he'd have in the squad, and that's Brendan Rodgers. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's why he, he went for him straight away. And he is a captain, but he doesn't need to be the captain. It's a bit like the Seville team. He's eleven guys who were absolute winners, who were absolute leaders. And that's what I want from any Celtic team. For, for too long, we had guys who were playing who were empty jerseys, who, when the chips were down, were shiting it and not wanting the ball. Exactly. You don't, you don't want that. Kilo Tour is the kind of guy that will take the ball under pressure and pass it forward, make it easy, put it back to the keeper. I remember, His distribution's amazing, man. His, like, his passing's class. Aye, aye. I remember, uh, I think it was uh, Chris Sutton's autobiography, he's talking about the, the kind of, uh, the, obviously, the Martin O'Neill team. And he talks about like times where he had to like separate Stylian Petrov and Bobo Baldi from like having a, a fucking stand up fight in the dressing room and stuff like that. And under Ronnie Daly, you just couldn't imagine any of the players doing stuff like that. You know, they just didn't have it have it in them to fight each other. But now, well, that's it. now we're exactly. getting to a stage where you actually think, well, I mean, maybe we're getting men back again. Maybe we're getting people that are actually going to fucking fight for the jersey fight to be in the team. That, that's it exactly. And- being a Celtic fan, you want them to fight for the jersey and, and fight for Celtic and fight for it means the way, the way we would. But at the end of the day, they don't need to be Celtic fans, they need to be professionals who take pride in what they do. And right. for years, we had guys like Puki, Skepovic, uh, and Guemo, <laughs> shite sh- bags who, who wouldn't fight for that. And there's, there's no point in having these guys playing for Celtic because when they go to Ibrox, he's well bending over with guys like your team, in my opinion. Right. You know, right. there was, did you, did you, did you read um, Tom English's? Re- re- article on the BBC website today. Aye, how about there being an old firm game by name only or something like that? Aye, and he's like, it's just like it's Celtic or so I say. But he spoke about how Brendan Rodgers actually quoted Jockstein in his pre-match uh, talk. Did you see that? Oh no, no I've not read that, mate. Nah, no, he basically said that Brendan Rodgers actually used um, a quotes from Jockstein um, to, you know, obviously because yesterday was the thirty-first anniversary of Jock's passing. Um, mm-hmm. And he sort of used some of that influence. I mean, not that these players should need that influence, but um, it was. I think it was also the five-year anniversary of um, the passing of Roger's father as well. So there was, uh, it was quite an emotional uh, day that. all around. I, and obviously Celtic going and winning. It's 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 mad that we've sat and we spoke here for about 20, 25 minutes or so, <laughs> and we haven't even mentioned fucking Griffiths because arguably our best player. He can't even play. He didn't play. He can't play against Barcelona. Are we concerned? No. Because Dembele, to, stepped, Dembele more than stepped up. One goal would have been sufficient to score three. One thing that's uh, amazing for me about Dembele, and it's, uh, it's going back to the conversation we've already had about Dembele and Griffiths and the different types of players, is that Dembele's had two starts. I think it was with Motherwell at home and uh, I, yesterday, and that's ten team goals in two games. I made a similar point to a uh, mate in my work who emailed me and he said, how are you feeling about the morning with Griffin will play? I think he's seen as a bit nervous. And I said, well, we'll bring in Dembele and he'll play with Sinclair. The two of them dovetail pretty well. They destroyed Motherwell and I don't see a big difference between Motherwell and Rangers. So I see a similar score. Right. So 5-0, 5-0 and 5-1. I think I was pretty, pretty lucky with the prediction. I wish I'd put it in the bookies. <laughs> one, of my can... pals, one of my pals won a grand. Fuck's sake. Is that, is that that picture of Paul the Tim? It's on Twitter with the wad of money, your, your mate? No, it's not my fault. I don't know. Paul I've seen that. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think most um, most Tims have uh, scooped quite well, so good. And you can't beat. It's, a, it's one thing beating the Rangers, it's just as good beating the bookies. Right. Yeah, exactly. Just just, just on that, like um, I'm using Opta Celtic Twitter here, which is really good. Uh, Dembele, overall record 11 appearances, 6 starts, 7 goals, 1 assist. 
660 minutes played. That's an amazing return for a guy. Is, is he even 20 yet? I think he's just 20, aye. Yeah. Right, I mean, come on. Like, let's let's be real here. Like, let's let's assume he continues in the same, similar sort of vein. He ends up scoring, like, I don't know, 15, 20 goals a season for us. He's going to score more than that. Are, we, are we going to be able to keep him? No, absolutely not. Are we, we will probably get a lot of money for him when the time comes to sell him. Uh, that, that's why you that's why you the outlay guys like that you pay them the high wages like they did with uh, guys in the past and you sell them on for 12 15 million and that, that that's a blueprint that Lowell should be working on but in the past they've been buying dicks like Pookie and stuff like that <laughs> you're, not gonna, for... you're not going to let this Pookie chat go so. <laughs> he's always the first one that comes to my mind because I, I wasn't a, a great fan of him yeah I mean, but I like when Dembele, if and when he does leave, and it's, 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 I mean, he's only 20 and he's at the start of his career, um, he's going to get us a lot of money when he leaves. And, and this brings me on to the, the, the next person that I want to talk about, and it's Kieran Tierney. Mm-hmm. I mean, what happens now with Tierney? Like, he's, he's putting in these performances on a consistent basis. He, I don't, I think he's only just turned 19. Aye. Uh-huh. And like, he's come in, he's, he's now a fully fledged international. He's a left back, a traditional old school left back. He can pass, he can shoot. See that see see, um, some of the passing he made yesterday, like the, the slip through for Sinclair, and obviously he set up Armstrong's goal. I mean, like, this is a wee guy at nineteen year old. Like this, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, how how long are we going to be able to hold on to Kieran Tierney? I think he I'm wants to sure. stay. I think he, I think he wants to stay, and I don't think he'll ever want to leave unless the board basically are sent him unity goal because we want the money. I think yeah. you may be right with that one, Graham. I think as long as we give him as much as we can afford to give him. I'm sure he'll get offers of 50 odd grand a week the way the Premiership's going, but if we can show him that we're giving him as much as we can afford, I've got the feeling he's the kind of guy that it might just stay with Celtic for, for a long time. Aye. I want a one-club player like, but, like Paul McStay or he, something. Aye. Even if he gives us three or four right good seasons and then he goes on uh, to play for a so-called bigger club in a, in a better league, then I, I don't see much ill feeling towards him because... Yeah. Yeah. He is a w- one guy for a long time who is living the dream. He is a Celtic fan mm-hmm. playing for the team. He represents us out there on the pitch and he knows it. And like you can tell in his post match interview yesterday, he was like absolutely buzzing. He's talking about all oh, my family were there today, as they're always there every week. Oh. They support me, but they're Celtic fans. You know, we'll go home, there's a party tonight and all that. I mean, it's just, as I want to ask this question, is he the best prospect we've had since Brian McLaughlin? <laughs> <laughs> no, is he the best prospect we've had? Yeah, I don't know, since Paul McStay, is he the best prospect since Maloney, since McGeady? Like, how, how highly do you rate Tierney? I, think I would say, yeah. from play, from watching him play in the first team, he is, but he probably wouldn't have got the press that Maloney and McGeady got because they're attacking kind of flair-like players, but he's just a kind of, a, 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 does does his job, but does it weapon. absolutely brilliant. Well, just when you're talking about how good a guy he is, um, somebody put on Twitter yesterday saying, um, we'll never get to walk out at Celtic Park as a player, but that's okay because we'll live it through this young man with a picture of uh, Tierney. So I screenshotted it and sent it to him as a private message and, and he actually got back to me and said, Belter. <laughs> I didn't realise that when you said that to me, I didn't realise that was you. I thought it was just like a viral thing. It was mine. I was like, that's fucking class. <laughs> nah, it's just be- nah, nah, it's just between me and him. Yeah, oh, I mean, aye. so aye, Tierney, are like a future captain. And even if he stays at Celtic for another five years, he's still only, what, 24, 25? Right. <laughs> so, I mean, you could, you wouldn't grudge him leaving in a few years' time. Obviously, he's come in and dislodged. He's got rid of Izagiri. He'll stay for the and ten, and then he'll be he'll more be up, up for the ten. Uh, aye, sure. for the ten. Aye. Um, Beaton, what do you think of Beaton? That's, that's actually the player that I wanted to bring up next. I thought right. Beaton. Uh, he's. I think he's really stepping back up to where he should be this season. That that through ball for the second goal. Was, aye, was aye. So the I what you're saying is right. Like the, the passing, his his passing is one of the best things that he has is his main asset is his passing and the weight of the passes that he the weight of his passes it's not something that you can teach him when he plays that through ball it's drilled it along the deck and Dembele runs on and you're thinking yeah. it's funny when Dembele's taking that shot you can see Scott Sinclair like ah, fucking give me the ball uh, twice he does it and like, like... And, and, <laughs> exactly and if he, if he squares it it's going in as well but like the, the cheek, he's got the cheek to actually Outside of the boot, but I do think. We are we teaching that, man? Are we, are we doing that in training? Just everyone has to score with outside of the boot or something? Uh, yeah, it's, that's <laughs> like the third or fourth goal this season because Forrest has scored a couple and someone uh, else. But we turned could have played in his slippers, eating his hummus, the hummus hadji, <laughs> about in his fucking overcoat yesterday. It was there's, like. There's a bit the, yesterday where uh, 
he brings the ball backwards and uh, I think the fans are about to get a bit kind of restless it's in the first half and he just plays it back to Toure Toure plays it back to him he, he swivels a bit and plays it out to Tierney and it's just this really simple bit of play but it opens up a big part of the field he yeah, just looks I as, think that's... as calm as fuck man See, when Rogers um, in his press conference a few weeks ago talked about the fans being patient, I think it's that what he's talking about. A lot of times you'll see Toure take his time in the ball, uh, pass it back to the keeper, go to Skiachenko out wide, and guys around me and I myself in the past have been saying, come on, get it forward, hit Sinclair, hit Forrest. But if the ball's no on, it's no on. Right. So that that's the patience he's talking about. But you can't attack teams every second of the game you need to, there needs to be an ebb and flow like, where they, they kind of take their eye off the ball and you play about with them and then you attack them and I think we're seeing that from Rodgers it's as if the players know when to speed it up and when to slow it down mm-hmm. yeah yep. the argument there, there's a constant argument that Brown and Beaton can't play in the same team but yesterday they were completely fine they were, they were completely fine together yesterday I had no, had no qualms at all well, and one thing I liked about Beaton yesterday I don't know if you saw the official TV post-match interviews like um well after the game, as the players are leaving the stadium, uh, they catch Beaton, and he's uh, they're talking about the yellow card that he, he got when oh, he yeah. uh, who was it? I can't remember. He, he halved one of their players. At the Gardner, I think it is, or something. Uh, did did uh, he uh, actually? Grancha, it was Grancha, oh, no, he clipped it back his heels. Oh, I definitely. Right. It's like Cause... it was Grancha. By the way, Grancha, did you see? <laughs> it's like he was like, drenched in sweat within five minutes, and he was blown at his ass. Uh, and did you see that video that's on YouTube uh, on on fucking Twitter? And he's like try to catch up with like he's like just not even not he, he can't even keep up with like the players. He's just like jogging alongside them. It, it was like that Yaya Touri, that Yaya Touri video from last season. He's just not even trying. He's it reminds me of when you like first. start playing five sides with your wee brother's friends and you just want to fucking grab them by the back of the shirt and pull them back because I'm right. moving so fast. He was blown out his ass, but um, Beaton wasn't even. He was just like, ah, yeah, I had to take that card for the team. I had no problem doing it. Uh-huh. And he's like, and I knew that after that I had to keep calm. I know I had to like be disciplined and, and I'm really happy and he goes on to say like how much he's loving and being at Celtic and this is the best atmosphere he's ever experienced that's him being here for I think that's this is his third or fourth season uh, he's been there for quite some time but I uh, thought it was Lennon's last yesterday. season they came in wasn't it Lennon's last uh, 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 well, he, was never, he was never really used but um, I like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Beaton he certainly says the right things in interviews and things like that yeah. I think um, some of his performances last year could go in the the category where he just doesn't seem to be given a hundred percent, like we kind of discussed earlier. Mm-hmm. That's not on like that kind of. You just think you've got to play for professional pride, and sometimes I just felt maybe it's his language, kind of natural way of running or way of passing. You're thinking, give us more. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? He just didn't seem to be given a hundred percent, but no, he strolled it yesterday, and if he can give us more performances like that, there's no problem in, in having him. What do I you mean, think? What, the two of you is, what do you think would be the way that you would, if you were the manager, what way? How would you? How would you treat Moussa Dembele from now on? Given the fact that we're probably going to be playing with this system where we have one up front, do you just play... Is Griffiths the first choice and you play Dembele every now and again? Or do you... What, 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 what do you think going forward? It's a difficult question and it's a, it's a good problem to have, really. Uh, mm-hmm. I, 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 I don't know. I, like, I think I would t- just let him know how much of a special talent he is and how important he is to the team and to the squad. And one thing Rogers has said on a few occasions is, as far as he is concerned, the, the team that ends the game is as, as important as the team that starts the game. So if you go to Barcelona and, um, for example, if Griffiths was fit and he was to play Griffiths up front, it may be with the mind, with the plan that Dembele is the man to come on with half an hour to go and put him to the sword. Mm-hmm. So just because you're not starting in the first eleven doesn't mean you're not the main man. That's a, a bit of a prehistoric kind of way of thinking. Mm-hmm. When you're yeah. a wee guy and you think, I'm not playing, uh, I'm, I'm not the best player. Whereas if you're the best player, maybe maybe hold you back and we'll keep you to put you on when, when, they're, not, when they're not expecting you. Aye. Uh, no. Uh, and I, I think one one thing I would say about the, the, the choice that, that we have to make is to remember that Dembele's 20. So... Mm. You know, I would I, if 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 you're asking me who I play, if the both of them are fit, then it's Griffiths because mm-hmm. Griffiths is more mature, he's older, he's wiser, he's scored more goals, he's done it over a longer period of time, and I would just bring Dembele in as and when. And as Gilly points out, uh, Rogers is a fan of like he he stresses that um, the team that finishes the, the match is just as important as the team that starts, and Dembele is going to get those minutes. Um, but if, if I had to choose, it would be. I'm a big fan of Griffiths, and I know, Graham. No, you're not. You're, not you're, you're, you're coming round to him. One thing I would say yesterday was that 
if you watch it back, especially in the second half, just the, the way that he constantly is able to make the ball stick up front by coming short for it, holding the ball up. And when when you think about, oh, obviously it's not going to be a problem Tuesday because we've not got the option. But Manchester City, if we're going to be going four five one, for me the one should be Dembele because he's the one who will hold the ball. And we're not going to we're not going to have a situation where we're constantly attacking for Griffiths to get the goals. We need the ball to get held up so we can bring Sinclair and Forrest uh, or Roberts into the game. What do you think about that? Uh-huh. Oh, it's, it's horses for courses, isn't it? <coughs> and it's it's a it's a great um, headache for Rodgers to have. Mm-hmm. I mean, like far better compared to last season when it was if, if uh, Griffiths was not fit mm-hmm. or fucked essentially. Mm-hmm. But on um, Dembele, I, f- I felt like in the first half, yes, in the first thirty minutes, he didn't get on the ball enough, and that wasn't his fault. Mm-hmm. We just didn't get the ball to him enough. But in the two or three occasions where he did get the ball, he looked excellent, and he was um, creating space, and he was worrying their defenders. There was a point, I think it was nil nil, when he took a, a kick out, chest it down, and like, stood in the ball and just held off two of their players and played right. a simple pass. And it was just a kind of, I'm the man. Right. Yeah. You just kind of really, really get near me. He, he has this kind of strength and swagger about him that he can't train, he can't teach. Mm-hmm. And as, as, as well as he does for Celtic, I've got a feeling that he'll go on and be a, a kind of top, top player. I don't yeah. want to talk too much, I don't want to say anything about the Huns apart from that uh, one guy, Garner. He has he has learned the way of the hun fucking quick man. Like, yeah. did you see him like pretending to get elbowed in the face and then he claimed that she, uh, he claimed that Spitschenko stamped on him when he didn't at all. That's the old Lee McCulloch syndrome. Aye. He used to smash some with studs up and roll about the deck and uh, Craig Thompson would be letting you go off the park and book the other guy. Aye. 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 So, 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 Kyle, bags. Kyle move five when he when he, he fucking absolutely. Ends Kyle's season, and, and, and it's like the December game. I guess the first of January game years ago. Fucking ended uh, so, Kyle's Celtic. Aye, game, I pretty much ended Kyle's career, and then he, he feigned injury, and he, I, I'm not even sure he got booked for it. Uh, but anyway, um, aye, I've got what, a few. I've got a few vines uh, that I'll put out later on. Where um, McCulloch's uh, no getting touched, and he's hitting the deck, holding his face. He's a wanker. <laughs> aye, he's a wanker. That, that, well, that's that, that's enough of uh, that fucking triangle face, fucking wank. <laughs> um, we, need, we should also talk about very briefly before we finish um, Sinclair uh, and obviously uh, Dembele's through ball for Sinclair was fucking class yeah aye. absolutely was. fucking class you see it again and you're thinking how does that manage to go through there aye. how does that manage Brilliant, to fit man. through and then Sinclair obviously talks away Sinclair's a class player him and Tierney are looking quite good on the left like the two aye, um, they've got an understanding they're very good understanding and Tierney is a fast wee guy and Sinclair is rapid and he can score and he can beat a man. What a signing he's been. And it's, uh, it's, 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 it says a lot when we sign quite a decent sized EPL, or well, ex-EPL name for Celtic and he's not even really talked about as being the main man when we've got Tierney, we've got Dembele and Griffiths. The best thing about that Dembele free ball for me was that it was the hardest ball to play. Exactly. It it left, it exactly. Uh, that would have been the easy option but it never went yeah. through it. So... Yeah, but what about uh, Tuesday night? Should we give that a little kind of preview before we go? Just one more thing. I, I don't, we've not talked about uh, Dembele sending Centros uh, outside for the hot dogs for the second goal. Oh, brilliant man! <laughs> I mean, with, it was with fucking Lobo. Pack. It was Lobo versus uh, Wixon, was it? Aye, Aye. I can see the similarities. But what um, I was saying to like, my mates and that is, let's like, see when we guys are playing football, they're trained when you're through and goal, take your touch, take your breath, and then score. Aye. Hit your shot. This guy's doing it in one of the bit hardest atmospheres in the world. He's, it, he's done it for a hat trick. Well, for his two goals anyway, he's took his touch and just banged him in. Right. His header's brilliant, brilliant as well. So he's a perfect hat trick. Right. Can't ask for much more. No, you, we couldn't have asked for much. One goal would have been more than enough yesterday. But I, we, I want to just you know, say something else about Dembele here while we're fucking jacking off to him. <laughs> Basically, the, 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 the last goal that he scores, the ball from Lustig is amazing. And you can see Dembele points. Points perfect. To, Dembele points to where he wants it. See the touch that he takes. See the uh, first touch uh, that he takes with his right foot. It's absolutely perfect, and then just rattles at home, and then he's off into the crowd. It's fucking absolutely. Uh, what a <laughs> what, what, a, what a day! And so, what was that like? Just to finish, then um, before we talk about the uh, the Barca game, um, after the the game, how how long were you in the stadium for? Did you stay right like way beyond the the, the final way whistle? Way beyond uh, the final whistle, probably about up to ten minutes. Um, the, the, the players all went over to the Green Brigade, the singing section, and the whole place was bouncing. They were kind of, rightly so, they kind of get most of the atmosphere going. So the players go over to them, 
uh, it was bouncing the Moose of Belly song and it was just without maybe the wrong word but there's always a bit of relief when you beat Rangers I mean especially because it would have been embarrassing if they we hadn't beat them to, to, so to beat them to hump them it was brilliant that's what we, we expected and we got what we expected um, and I, the whole uh, for me, I walked along the back road by like kind of Brendan's and the wee man's into McCool's and the whole place was bouncing. It was a brilliant atmosphere. The sun was out. It was just what you want for your fairy tale what, for the first time playing that, that scum. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And that's, as, as we say, as me and Graham living abroad, you know, sometimes we'll, we are watching it alone for various reasons and it's it's not quite the same. No, it's good It's good when the uh, uh, bad things happen. Uh, as you said earlier, we just turn the fucking computer off and that's it. Yep. Uh, but when the good things happen... Yeah. <laughs> ah, you do. So, that, I mean, but what, why were I saying that? I'm going to the Barca game on Tuesday. So, mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to that. They obviously lost last night, which means absolutely nothing in the grand scheme of things. But uh, I'm looking forward to actually getting a bounce with the Celtic fans, like, with the troops and that. And then, uh, for the game, I don't have any expectations at all. I just don't want to get scalped. I reckon we will probably score, but I don't think we have any chance of, of taking any sort of points from them. But the rest is, what was it, Suarez, Suarez, Messi and Iniesta were all rested last night, so, yeah. and Jordi, Jordi Alba as well never played, so... Yeah, although I'm pretty sure that they brought they brought Messi and Suarez on, I think, I'm not uh, sure Iniesta played, I didn't quite catch it, but they got beat off Divor Tivo Alaves and they just got promoted, they're like a really, it's like the equivalent of like fucking, I don't know. Fucking Rangers. Or something like that. <laughs> Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> it's, fucking Rangers. it's essentially what it is. I we got beat two one, but um, I don't have any I have any hopes. What he's doing for the game, uh, Graham? You'll be watching it. Are no, you I'm going? in Mallorca, uh, so mm. I'll be watching it. Hopefully in a, a, a bar. Hopefully there will be Celtic fans in there. Uh, CSC. There will be a CSC in Mallorca, guaranteed. Uh, Alternatively, you could just swim over, and I'll meet you at the camp because it's literally uh, across the water. What about yourself, Gilly? What are you up to for it? Uh, to me, uh, I was watching the house, um, but for me, the Champions League this season is just a complete bonus. Um, oh, aye. Uh, well, I wouldn't have really thought we'd have made it at the start of the season. Would I, would I hoped for it, but never really thought uh, in my heart of hearts would have made it. So it's just a complete bonus and enjoy the money we're going to make. And for me, the great thing about the Champions League this year is guys like Sinclair, um, Dembele, will be getting, Tierney will be getting that experience of playing against these great players. And hopefully next year when we make it, I want to really see us Go for the second yeah, place in yeah. third place would be the last kind of um, at least. Ha- having said that, uh, I mentioned Glad get back, get humped again away Eight, from home. Nine. Uh, so it's three one by Freiburg who just got promoted and who lost last week in their first game. So they're definitely fucking beatable, I man. Like especially at Celtic Park. <laughs> my, my, this the- champ. Sorry, these Champions League groups, so they never go the way you think you would. If you look through history and you look at the two strongest teams and everyone's like, those two stroll through it and then you end up with like Rosenberg and teams like that kind of sneaking mm-hmm. through. So maybe it Rangers. could be a year to have a, a bit of luck. I Rangers, <laughs> that old club, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, I, 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 I definitely agree. That just, just to say that I'm just, I agree with Gilly, I'm just happy to be there. I'm, I'm, I don't know if that's a popular opinion, but I'm just happy to be back in the big... The big money with the big boys and like the status that comes nope. with that and like people now know Celtic again. You know the, the people in Spain when they see my strip and they like they say things to me and they go, "Oh, Celtic, blah, blah, blah. Uh-huh. It's good. That exposure is very, very good for Celtic, and I'm just kind of happy to be there. And I agree. Like next season, you want to see a little bit of progression. I quite happily see us go out and then this and, it, and not happily, but I would you know if we go out and we go into the um, finish third and we go into the um, the Europa League, that would you know that would be quite satisfying for me. I just want uh, after Christmas football because that's when I can get to the game. Uh, I can always get yeah. to the first the first European game after Christmas, so that's what I want. Yeah, yeah. So I it's um an interesting an interesting weekend, an interesting week ahead, and then obviously with regards to the next podcast, Graham, the next podcast is going to be on the. It will be about the twenty fourth of September. I'm away to Mallorca for a week and then Oktoberfest for a few days, so it's going to be about ten day gap in between uh, the podcast again. This is the last of our fucking gallivant this year, man. After that, yeah. we're going to be wired in weekly podcasts. Get them out there, and we're and, going to and... do it on uh, Doctor Joe Vengloss. Yes. Dr. Joe. So if anyone has anything they want to say about Vengelos, this, that, or the next thing, please let us know. But yeah, so it's been an amazing weekend. It's about to be even better by uh, going on holiday and obviously playing Barca and this, that, and the next thing. So right. aye, it's been great. It's been an amazing Enjoy weekend. your trip. Cheers. Cheers mate. The one thing I would say uh, is that in the past, kind of, kind of a couple of years, you get these teams like Malmo and stuff that qualify, and then they go to teams like Madrid or whatever and get humped like 7 7 0 and 7 1. 
I just want to make sure that we go over there and we're fucking organised and show that we are not one of these fucking cannon for cannon for the teams, man. Just show get show something to su- suggest that we can fucking hold our own. You know what I mean? Just get keep the score down think, yeah. or fucking get a draw. You know. I don't think it's going to be an issue of scoring goals. It's just going to be conceding aye, a lot of goals. Aye. We have that. We have this. We have this ability to like score a lot of goals against teams like Bills Punch yesterday and teams like Motherwell and that. But when it comes to like we do defending. Concede, <laughs> yeah, defending is an issue. Even though we now have one of our best, you know, centre centre half parents in a long time, we've got Tierney. It's just the, the, the kind of um, cavalier approach to football that we have just now that we tend to lead goals. But it, it's one thing we never pointed out that I would like to say is like the mentality of the Celtic, the strength, the mental strength that the team has this season compared to the past two is. Aye, aye. it's incredible and I think when when you look at that that time we beat them with a the Tony Watt uh, goal that was what Adam Matthews at left back Kelvin Wilson and Effie Ambrose in the centre of defence I think that shows it's all about the, how you're set up and how you're organised and the players aren't that important it's about what you're told when you go into the pitch you know what I mean if we're, if we're organised enough then it should be should be a case of being competitive at least yeah as long as, uh, yeah, yeah. As, long as you don't get fucking Shagged. Well, we had, we did get a down in Barcelona a few years ago, six one. But like when I think of Celtic Barcelona, that's not the, the game that comes to my mind. So the, the, these these games happen. Like Barcelona will beat far better teams than Celtic by a few goals. So uh-huh. as long as you don't want it to happen, there's no point in getting too worried about uh-huh. it. Like our friends from the other side of the city will make a big deal about it if it does happen. But I don't really get a fuck to be fuck honest because we're we're somewhere uh-huh. they're miles away from. No uh-huh. friends of me. No friends of mine. <laughs> <laughs> So let's move on to the, the feedback. The first one is from Martin Melly, who is at Martin Melly 86 And he said, after listening to the Maloney pod, I made up an 11 that have come through our ranks since 2000. So what do you think? And then he gave us a team. In goals, it's David Marshall. In defence, it's Paul Caddis, John Kennedy, Stephen McManus and Kieran Tierney. Midfield is Liam Miller and Callum McGregor. Kind of attacking midfield, James Forrest, Aidan McGeady, Sean Maloney, and up front is Tony Watt. That's a pretty, it's a good idea, man. It's a good. Ah, it's pretty so. Is that Mr. Uh, Martin Melly for 20 minute terms? Yes, uh, I think. Aye, it, it must be. Aye. Aye. So. Aye. But actually, I was, I was looking at that team and I was thinking to myself, that's not actually much uh, weaker than the team that we've got out at the moment. Marshall's doing obviously quite well. Obviously, when Marshall was at Celtic, he won. Amazing, but he was pretty good. He's, he's now still in the Premiership. Cadiz is still playing. Kennedy, obviously, whatever happened to him. Uh, Tierney, Miller. Miller, Liam Miller, is that? Liam Miller, aye. Aye. All right. Okay, I was thinking Kenny Miller. Kidding on. <laughs> uh, Forrest, Maloney, McGady. Aye, that's, that's a pretty solid team. I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to think um, if we have a better striker than what just came through the ranks, but I don't think. Brian Prunty. Brian Prunty. <laughs> Butcher was, was, what, 98? Uh, he he was in the he was in the studio at Celtic TV yesterday. Uh, he was ninety eight, but uh, that's that's a, that's quite a decent squad to be honest. Uh, I, think, uh, I think out of them all, Cadis is the one guy. Him and maybe David Marshall, they've really went on to write good careers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's um as well like there's Ross Wallace mentioned there. No, I he think he would be before two thousand maybe. No, really? Ross Wallace. Nah, Ross Wallace is, should definitely be there because um, uh, he was at the same I, time as Maloney. And but Ross Wallace is a left back. and Tierney's a left back, so. Ah, of course. I, I yeah. think Ross Wallace plays quite far forward now, but he's doing well in the championship. He seems to score a few screamers every now and again. Yeah. Aye. Fuck it. Just so maybe, maybe we we'll, we were being too uh, critical of the the youth policy when you, when you look at those players on paper. I mean, yeah. obviously Steve McManus hasn't done much, and uh, Lee Miller's career has fallen off a cliff. But well, apart from that, well, if you look at most uh, SPL squads, I think most of them, apart from the new co, have got. Uh, Celtic um, youth team guys have come through certainly at Ross County Jackson uh, Irvin a few aye yeah, Jackson you Irvin take, Jackson Irvin was at Butler aye and put Jackson Irvin in for Liam Miller maybe aye uh, just because Liam Miller done the dirty aye good shout aye aye so who else have we got we've got one from uh, James Sweeney who's at James Sweeney 1 he said I feel disappointed that it wasn't 7-1 yesterday as I've said before, the change in the team is unbelievable. All hail King Rogers. I hail, 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 hail. I agree with that. I think um, what I felt with Rogers is there's a connection between the players and the fans in the club. Whereas under kind of Dyla and Strachan, that wasn't there. It was certainly there under Tommy Burns and under Lennon to an extent because you felt as if you're all in the str- struggling in the fight together. Whereas it seemed to die for a bit and Celtic are always at their best when they have that, when the fans are all on tune with what the club and what the team are doing. Mm-hmm. Aye, yeah, totally, yep. 
Declan Connolly at Declan Connolly 4 says uh, would you say this gives us any better of a chance taking something from the new camp and I think we've kind of discussed our new camp chances already so I don't know if that would give us a better chance but uh, I don't know every game gives you confidence I suppose doesn't it yeah, certainly I mean, doesn't help no, no. Yeah. and uh, the last last one is going to be from Robert Sherry again he's a uh, at politest underscore Ouija he says was it really surprising that we gave them a real doing? For me, uh, MD really showed that we have competition up front. Tuesday will be our biggest test defensively. Don't expect the result, but expect the team to play in a cohesive and organised way. And I think we've touched upon that as well. Yeah, on the head. That's exactly, that's, yeah. that's, that's exactly what I like. Don't get embarrassed. I know it's sort of Aye. a basic requirement, but don't don't go out and get your ass handed back to you. Just As I say, I, I don't have an issue with, with the striker department because we seem to score goals. It's just the, the leaky... The, the, the sort of the leaking of the goals, but I'm I just in the camp, just happy to be there, man. Aye, aye. What are we going to do with Samaras, Spotman? I think we need to bring him back for the game. Potentially, I mean, he scored how many goals against Barcelona? Two. I guess he scored twice at the new camp, man. Aye. So not bad. <laughs> right. So uh, that will do us for this week. Uh, so at Celtic underscore Vines, if you want to follow uh, Gilly on Twitter, for us, of course, it's at uh, Boys Abroad. For our uh, mildly homoerotic uh, Twitter account, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, just subscribes. Obviously, the best way to get uh, hearing our podcast every week: subscribe on iTunes or go tell to, a pal. Tell, tell a pal. A, I just like just go up to a random and just like hug them and then just whisper in their ear. Fucking history boys are right. Lee Wallace, a grass. Uh, Lee Wallace is a grass. And <laughs> and history boys are right. <laughs> Pass it on. I uh, so I think that'll do this for this week. <laughs> Brian Jackson on flute for you. We'll give us a little bit of help here. Help us out a little bit, Bynum. What it is. See that black boy over there running scared. His old man in a bottle. Said he done to quit hit 95. Big full time. That black boy over there running scared. His old man got a problem. He likes to drink too much. He done fucked up damn near everything. His old woman wears a drink from bottom. Don't you think it's a crime? Big time after time after time. People in a bottle. And people show up. Sister, her show was fine Before she started drinking wine For the bottle Well, she told me The old man committed a crime He's doing that Now she's hanging in a bottle I'm seen up Out there on the avenue All by herself She don't need help for the bottle And I've seen up Preacher man tried to help her out She cussed him out Hit him in the head with the bottle He turned to me and asked me I'm gonna start some trouble. See that gent in a rig on suit? Now he done damn near thrown his cool little bottle. Well, he was a doctor helping young girls know if they wasn't too far gone to have problems. I mean, complications, but business of the dollar eagle said, What you doing, man? Ain't